All right, we begin uh, first uh, Timothy for Beginners. Uh, this is lesson number two in that series, the title of this lesson, Paul's Charge to Timothy. We're going to begin in the area of, uh, actually begin chapter one, verses one to 11. So we've already reviewed the uh, background of Paul's first letter to Timothy, a little you know, review for you here. Uh, Timothy is a young preacher. He's working in the church at Ephesus. The church there seems to be embroiled in controversy with various teachers promoting uh, Gnostic ideas. Uh, Gnostic from the root word gnosis uh, referred to the uh, mixing of existing ideas from philosophy and pagan mysticism, Judaism and Christianity all mixed uh, together to create a new and as some were promoting a, a superior a form of doctrine, a kind of a new super gospel that was being promoted at that uh, church. And so Paul writes to Timothy with a mix of encouragement and challenge and teaching in order to help him confront the false teachers and uh, also to organize the church in a godly way to prepare it for service and uh, promote peaceful harmony. So today we're going to begin looking at the letter itself, gave you a lot of background information uh, last time. Uh, we begin with uh, chapter one, verse uh, one and two. Now when we look at our original outline of the book, we see that the first section is the short greeting uh, in verses one and two, and I read this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So in the first verse, uh, Paul introduces himself as an apostle of Jesus, you know, in the circle of 12, uh, by the command of both God and Jesus, the idea here is that he is not a, some sort of self-appointed apostle, he's not some sort of self-appointed teacher uh, as the teachers who were in Ephesus, the ones causing the problems. He's a legitimate teacher, legitimately called uh, by God, uh, equal to the other um, apostles. Uh, this, of course, establishes his authority and the authority of his teachings and the source of his authority and teaching comes from Jesus, comes from God, as did the authority of the uh, other apostles. Now very early in the letter, he introduces the idea uh, that Christ is our hope, worthy of our trust. Again, as opposed to trusting in some sort of special knowledge or secret knowledge or uh, these new teachers, uh, so this is, you know, it's not just what he's saying, it's uh, right from the start, he's addressing you know, what's going on there in, uh, uh, in Ephesus. He is a teacher that has authority, authority of Christ, therefore his teachings also have authority, not from himself, but authority from Christ. Now in verse two, he establishes the credibility and integrity of Timothy the recipient of the letter whom Paul blesses. Now the idea of a true child not only denotes their closeness, but also the fact that Timothy was trusted to represent Paul in spiritual matters. My true child, my official child, the one that I have confidence in. Uh, and so the blessing that he gives includes uh, grace, which means favor or good things, good things like past forgiveness and future hope of heaven. He mentions mercy, pity, help, compassion, and peace, uh, harmony between God and man and also between uh, man and uh, man. So with his opening uh, lines, Paul first of all declares his own authority, uh, the authority of inspiration from God, he confirms Timothy's charge to teach. I sent you there to teach, you need to teach. And he also offers a blessing on the evangelist who has a, you know, a pretty tough job uh, ahead of him. And we need to realize that this letter has the same charge to modern day preachers today, uh, has the same authority for the church uh, 
we are reading Paul's words, but if we're reading Paul's words, we're reading the words of Christ, who inspired him through the Holy Spirit, uh, and also has the ability to instruct and correct and build us up as well. We read this, uh, you know, as preachers today, we also uh, need the encouragement and the confidence uh, to teach with authority the things that are uh, written in uh, God's word. So in the next section, Paul is going to talk about himself and Timothy before going on to give instructions about the church in general. So Paul's charge to Timothy. Now Paul turns now to address Timothy directly and to charge him, meaning to challenge him concerning the carrying out of his ministry, uh, especially as it concerns what's going on in the book of Ephesus. So let's read uh, verse three. He says, as I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. So Timothy is reminded of his original charge or his, you know, his marching orders. And that was to instruct certain men not to teach other doctrines. Uh, when he says other doctrines, it's other doctrines or rather doctrines other than what he himself has been taught, what Timothy has been taught by Paul, the gospel and all the teaching that stems from the gospel. You instruct men not to teach other things other than that. No variation of, of that particular teaching. We know that some, the Gnostic teachers, were straying away from the teachings of Christ and the apostles, and Timothy was to rebuke them to admonish them not to do this. Now that wasn't his only job, of course. He had to preach and teach and encourage the church there and so on and so forth. But Paul is kind of zeroing in on this particular uh, issue at the beginning of his letter. In verse four he says, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. So he gives a brief description of the type of teaching not to listen to, and he reminds Timothy that godly teaching is restricted to matters that develop faith and knowledge of God's word. Uh, what kind of things you know, does he mean here about myths and endless genealogies? Well, Jewish myths that were not part of the scripture. Uh, speculation regarding genealogies uh, found in Gnostic genealogical tables. Okay. These things do not produce the things that are mentioned in the following verse. And let's read the following verse. He says, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And so, you know, just let's back up a little bit. He's saying, look, tell them not to teach things other than you know, the gospel and what stems from the gospel. And then he names a few things, you know, Jewish myths and other you know, Gnostic ideas that were floating about there. Tell them to, not to pay attention to those things because those type of teachings do not promote the key uh, objective of Christian teaching, and what is that? Well, then he says, exactly, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So the acid test for teachers teaching true and godly doctrine is the development of love as a direct result of that teaching. You know, the, the fruit of proper teaching from true teachers, Paul says, will be a, a pure heart. In other words, a clear mind and a clean mind and a clean heart. No confusion, no wavering, no doubt. A good conscience. In other words, if you are taught properly in the gospel, your conscience is clear. You understand that, or the student understands that the, their sins have been forgiven and they have a security in Christ and they have a sure hope of heaven. So you know, a good conscience, conscience rather. And a good conscience because as Christians, we are living a, a, a righteous life, not a perfect life, 
You know the old saying, I'm not a perfect husband, but I'm a faithful one. Well, I'm not a perfect Christian, but I am a faithful one. I strive for perfection. I strive to please God. I strive to resist the temptation. I continue believing each day that the blood of Christ washes me clean and makes me acceptable before God. So therefore I have a good conscience. You know, a good conscience isn't just, I have a good conscience because I never do anything wrong. No, a good conscience uh, is there because we know that even in the places where we fail, uh, as John says, if we confess our sins, Jesus is uh, you know, righteous uh, uh, to, to forgive us our sins, okay? And then he says, a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith, a solid faith, a faith that has assurance, a faith that's knowledgeable. You know, like I know why I have a clear conscience. I know why I have a, a, a sure hope in heaven. I know uh, how to have a pure heart. I know the things that I need to do. And I also know what to do when I fail. So th these are the things that are created by the teaching of the gospel, by the teaching of the words of Christ. Debates, pride, division, these are not the fruit of solid teaching from approved teachers. In verse six, he goes on to say, for some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion. So some teachers who are on the right path have been distracted, Paul says, and they're caught up in the false teaching. He says they have turned aside, means they have become apostate, having left the Christ-centered, cross-centered teaching of the apostles in order to champion this new knowledge, which Paul says is simply a waste of time. Why is it a waste of time? Because it doesn't produce the pure heart, the, the, the clear conscience, you know, the solid faith and hope. It doesn't produce those things. So it's a waste of time. No matter what else it produces, it doesn't produce that. Verse seven, he says, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. So we read this and it, it seems that their desire, there are these, these teachers here, Gnostic teachers, seems that their desire was to become something other than Christ-like. You know, the teachings of Christ are there to make all of us disciples more Christ-like. And he is saying here that you know, these people here, these teachers, this was not their desire to become more Christ-like. He mentions they want to be teachers of the law, refers to rabbis of the Jewish religion. They want to become like Christian rabbis teaching the law. They wanted to assume this position within the church. They wanted to create this role of authority for themselves within the church. You know, teachers of the law were not the same as Judaizers, remember, or the circumcision party who taught that you had to become a Jew and therefore be circumcised before you could become a Christian. So this, is, you know, this was another problem that was taking place in other uh, places. Uh, and of course, this isn't true, right? We don't have to be circumcised in order to become Christians. You know, Matthew 28, Mark 16 tells us that, uh, we, and Acts chapter two tells us that we, we need to believe in Jesus, repent of our sins, uh, be baptized. Uh, this is the process in becoming a Christian. And so teachers of the law were men who were using ascetic practices within the law, in other words, food laws and marriage laws, and they were mixing these with Gnostic mystery teachings in order to create, as I mentioned before, a new doctrine over which they became the new teachers, the new rabbis, if you wish, the arbitrators, the new Christian rabbi. So not only were they creating you know, a different gospel, a different doctrine, but they were also creating a new position for themselves within the church, a position of authority, a position to undermine the authority of the apostles, undermine the authority of God's word, undermine the authority of the evangelists that 
uh, Paul had sent to uh, work with the church there in Ephesus. In verse eight he says, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. And so Paul explains in this verse that the law was given for specific purposes and it could be used incorrectly as was the case uh, uh, in the Galatian church, for example, and as is the case here. You know, the Jewish Gnostic teachers had formulated a new and a better doctrine which was foreign to Christian teaching. So part of their teaching involved the law of Moses. By trying to bind certain elements of the law, okay, and part of the Gnostic teaching onto the consciences of the brethren, they were using the law incorrectly. Remember, the, the, the people at Ephesus, they were Christians, already saved, already forgiven. And so these teachers were kind of combining various elements of different you know, Jewish religion, Gnostic ideas, you know, mystery religious ideas, and they were mixing all this together to create a new religion, a new gospel, and they were in charge, and they were the ones who were the authoritative uh, teachers. And many of the things in this, quote, new super gospel were placing burdens on Christians, things they had to do, things they had to abstain from in order to be considered faithful, in order to be considered true, if you wish. So um, Paul is saying uh, these people here, these teachers, they're using the law, they want to be quote teachers of the law, you know, they want to be rabbis, but they don't even know how to use the law. They don't understand what the proper usage of the law is. And so in verse 9a he says, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person. So he goes on to explain some of the correct uses for the law. When we're talking about the law, we're talking about the Ten Commandments and all the ordinances contained in the Old Testament. So he said, these people want to use the law and be experts in the law and they want to bind things of the law on you, but they don't even understand what the purpose of the law is. And so in, verse, uh, in, in, in these verses here, he, uh, he talks about the correct uses of the law. First, uh, to reveal the nature of sin. That's a proper use of the law. Romans 3, uh, 20 and, and 7, uh, 7. The law is there to show you where you are mistaken, to show you where you are sinful, to show where you fall short. That's the purpose of the law, like a mirror, to be able to see yourself properly, to be able to judge your conduct uh, you know, and your intentions. And that's, that's what the law is there for. Secondly, to reveal the punishment for sin. In Romans 6, 23, you know, the wage of sin is death. The law is there also to show you what the consequences are for breaking the law, for disobeying the law. That's another purpose of the law. And thirdly, the law reveals God's justice. You know, God's justice is if you sin, you die, but if you obey the law, you live. In Romans 6.23, the entire verse says, the wage of sin is death, but, he says, the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So the law also reveals you know, uh, God's justice and how it can be uh, fulfilled. However, the law was never given so that a person could justify himself before God. That wasn't the purpose that the law was, was given. It was designed to show us how we needed forgiveness and mercy, not as a measuring stick for our righteousness. And that's how they were using it, as a measuring stick for righteousness. Here's, and, and they weren't even using it, they weren't even using the whole law. But they were using parts of the law to, to say, okay, now if you obey this, if you follow this, you know, you'll, you'll be righteous, you'll be saved, you'll be pleasing to God. So let's read the complete verse now. It says, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers. So remember in the previous verse it said, you know, the law, was, you know, the law wasn't given for us to become righteous. Here the law is for sin, sinful people. 
and he mentions some. He shows that the law is not directed at those who are saved. Christians are under the principle of grace, not the principle of law. Under grace, God forgives our sins over and over again, and He bears with our weaknesses, and He promises to transform us into perfect spiritual beings at the resurrection. And He asks that we trust in Christ and we remain faithful. That, that's, those are the conditions under grace. Under the law, if you sin once, you're condemned. Anything less than perfection is unacceptable. You are saved and receive glory only if you do not sin. And he mentions the types of sins and sinners that are subject to the law. Paul therefore emphasizes the fact that Christians are not under law because the law is designed for godless, unrepentant, ignorant sinners, then as well as now. And so Paul goes on to give examples of these type of people which the law will judge. And just give a list here. He mentions those who are lawless, those who know the law but act without concern for it, pagans without knowledge as well, the disobedient, rebellious individuals, spoiled, undisciplined, those who refuse to obey the law, ungodly, those who are irreverent and impious without respect for spiritual things. Sinners uh, is a reference to those who are wicked, evil, immoral. Unholy, in other words, totally devoted to the world. They're unholy, there's nothing holy about their thought, nothing holy about their goals, nothing holy about their spirits, everything is focused on the world, they are unholy. Profane, those who ridicule spiritual or holy things. Some people don't care about holy things. Some people have no holy things in their lives. Some people make reference to holy things, but only to ridicule those things. Murderers of parents. Well, that's pretty, that's self-explanatory, isn't it? Manslayers, in other words, people who are aggressive and violent, unkind, oppressors. Immoral persons, here immoral sexually, fornication and all kinds of sexual sins. Sodomites, uh, homosexuals, uh, translated in English homosexual, but the Bible has no word for homosexual. The Bible doesn't even consider that such a thing can exist, that someone is a homosexual. So it, the word, you know, there were homosexuals uh, at that time, but the Bible does not designate that activity with a name. And so uh, usually it simply describes the actions. You know, a man who sleeps with, uh, with men as men sleep with women, okay? So it describes the action of homo, homosexuals. These are also uh, condemned under the law. Kidnappers, in those days, uh, slave traders. Uh, liars, in other words, hypocrites, those who are dishonest, and perjurers, being false with the intent to injure someone else, not keeping vows, not keeping promises. Now this is not a complete list of sins, but rather a representation of the kinds of people and sins that the law will reveal, condemn and judge, and then punish. So he's saying, hey, the law isn't for those who are saved, they're under, they're under grace. No, the law is going to be used for those who are not saved, for those who have rejected the gospel. It'll be used to reveal their sins, to reveal their punishment and condemnation. That's what the law is for. In verse 10b and 11, he says, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So Paul completes this part by saying that aside from this list of sins, God will punish uh, those who teach anything else other than the gospel given by Christ and taught by the apostles. And so the point he makes here at the end is that any system of philosophy or religion which promotes another way to come into communion with God other than salvation obtained through faith in Jesus Christ, 
anyone else that promotes something other than that will be judged and condemned and punished under the law as something sinful. So you can add, in other words, you can add to lawlessness and homosexuals and violence and liars, da, 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 da. you can add to that list those who teach something other than the gospel. Those people will be judged by the law. And so Paul establishes early on in his charge to Timothy that only the gospel given by God to Christ and then to the apostles is valid teaching. Only the gospel is valid teaching. By extension, this does two things. One, it establishes Timothy and his teachings as legitimately coming from God, because Timothy was teaching the proper gospel. And two, it condemns the teachings and teachers of this new Gnostic gobble, uh, <laughs> gobble, gospel, uh, this, this new super gospel, uh, Paul says, no, this, this, this is unacceptable. This teaching is unacceptable and will be judged and punished as well. All right, but we'll stop here. It's a good stopping point as far as our, you know, our survey of the text itself. A Couple of lessons that we can draw just from this opening uh, section here in Timothy. First lesson, nothing changes, nothing changes. 2,000 years later, the sins are exactly the same. You know that list that I just read? Those are today's sins, aren't they? People, don't people lie? Don't people have illicit sexual activity? You know, they're, they're today's sins. And the punishment is exactly the same. People will be you know, judged by the law, condemned according to the law. And of course, the way of salvation is exactly the same. And, and there continues to be all kinds of ways and solutions for man's sins that keep God and the cross of Christ out of that solution. So you know, 2,000 years ago, it was the Gnostic teachers that said, this is the way to live. Today we have all kinds of philosophies, all kinds of ideas uh, that give us the way to live. As a matter of fact, today the ideas are more uh, uh, in, in, in taking God out of the equation. We don't need God, we take God doesn't exist, we take Him out of the equation, this is how you should live. You know? So nothing changes. The sins are the same. There's still an effort to find another way to live, another way to be pleasing, another way to find God other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing changes, even today. Second thing, second lesson. The gospel is our only response, as far as we're concerned. You know, Paul in the book of Romans uh, chapter 116 said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God unto salvation. So there are many young Timothys today who are nervous and insecure in their faith thinking they are no match for the slick atheists of our time or the apologists who embrace a universal spirituality with no reference to Christ. You know, people say, well, I'm, I'm not religious, I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I embrace all spirituality and all religions. You know, they're all the same in the end, they all bring you to God. Yeah, that sounds good and soothing, but that's not true according to God's word. You know, these people who are out there teaching these things uh, are out there today, again, as they were back then. So nothing new here, nothing changed since the beginning. The same cast of sinners and unbelievers and religious teachers who promise heaven without the cross of Christ and who lead the ignorance into greater darkness. So we don't need to prove anything to atheists or disprove anything to those who have another religion. Our task, like Timothy, is to simply proclaim the gospel and announce that forgiveness of sin is available and live our lives in such a way that demonstrates that we actually believe what we preach. The temptation to outsmart or out-debate atheists or to deconstruct everyone else's ideas about religion or spirituality, this is the devil's way of immobilizing us with the fear and ridicule of others and self-doubt. <laughs> Jesus didn't say to the apostles, go into all the world and uh, deconstruct every false religion that's out there. 
He didn't say, go, go into the world and, 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 and debate every atheist and demonstrate how every atheist you know, uh, thinking is improper. He didn't say that. He said, go into all the world and do what? Uh, proclaim the gospel. We're proclaimers. We proclaim, and <laughs> an easy way to remember this, we proclaim and uh, to those who accept the gospel, we then explain in detail. So we've been sent to proclaim and explain our faith, not other people's ideas about religion. Paul wasn't ashamed because he knew that the gospel message itself had the innate power to reach everyone, from the pious Jew to the most worldly Gentile. The message of the gospel resonated with all kinds of people. So if, as Christians, we have only one response to questions and challenges and ridicule, and that is the simple message of the gospel proclaimed in love. If we have answered with this, we have fulfilled our own charge given to us by Christ to preach the gospel to all nations. I don't have to explain your religion to you. My only task is proclaim the gospel to you and explain that if you have questions. Okay, so this is a good spot to stop. We'll continue with the, our study of uh, Timothy uh, next week. Thank you very much for your attention.